I am Tuli Njingela um, from South Africa. I come from an organization called the Sustainable Livelihoods Foundation. Um, it's a research organization that does research in uh, a number of things, but uh, we have three um, <laughs> overarching areas, which are um, health and welfare. We also look at the informal economy, as well as um, the ecology. And it wouldn't feel right for me to introduce myself alone. I'm mm. with uh, Rukia, who's from Sorke, uh, who is about to get up and say something. <laughs> 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 and save me. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hello, Hello. smart people. <laughs> Fairly intimidated. I'm from Sonke. Sonke means together, it's coming together, uh, gender justice toward gender justice. And uh, we work with multiple, I guess, multiple range of stakeholders on both addressing sexual and gender-based violence, engaging men and boys in ending men's violence against women. And we work on HIV and gender equality. And um, I think that's some of, that's enough. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. <coughs> Uh, my name is Philip Otieno. I come from Kenya, working with an organization known as Men for Gender Equality Now. Uh, Men for Gender Equality Now uh, focuses on engaging and working with men and boys in uh, prevention and response <coughs> to issues of sexual and gender-based violence, prevention of uh, HIV, the spread of HIV and AIDS, and ultimately uh, promotion of gender equality. The organization was started uh, way back in the year 2001 with the sole purpose of uh, engaging men to be able to talk to other men to end uh, violence against women, sexual gender-based violence, and again, like I say, um, to bring about uh, social justice. Thank you. Hi, I'm Satish, uh, working with Center for Health and Social Justice, uh, organization based in Delhi, working at uh, national level. And uh, CHSJ is working, uh, one area is the health, so health, uh, policy advocacy or the health rights are for the marginalized people, as well as working with men for gender equality. And for this uh, sector, we host the Secretariat of Forum to Engage Men at national level, as well as facilitate the network called Mass for Men's Action to Stop Violence Against Women, uh, based in uh, um, working in the Uttar Pradesh, North India, part uh, Northern India, and uh, one, one biggest state as well as uh, you can see the very patriarchal, very subtle violence there and uh, feudalism is there. And Maswa is working from 2002. I am also founder member of that and a convener and still facilitating the process. Uh, Maswa is a group of uh, network, uh, group of individual and uh, activist, uh, academic, student, media person. Those came with the, with the passion and with the belief that uh, we uh, are being a man is certainly part of the problem, so we have to part of the solution. Our our silence is our silence is perpetuating the violence. So we cannot say uh, without speaking that we are not committing the violence. And then we are trying to mobilize people and and trying to build allies with the various social movement as well as the women organization to take the responsibility and take the public position and move the uh, root to address the root cause of the violence and, and try to achieve the gender equality and make it success. Uh, hi everybody, um, my name is Emma Fami. I'm one of the co-founders for an initiative called Harass Map. Harass Map is um, an initiative that was established in 2008 with the aim of uh, ending social acceptability of sexual harassment in Egypt. We do have a very high percentage of women subjected every day to harassment. We, more than 95 of the Egyptian women experience at least being sexually harassed. Um, so it's quite um, a, like um, sexual harassment as, social, as a form of social uh, gender-based violence is quite prevalent in Egypt, and we have different organizations working together. To, to end it, and with me and my two colleagues who also can introduce themselves, Mihaela and Mirat, they work with two other initiatives. Uh, okay, so I'm, uh, I'm Nihel, um, I'm from an organization called POSMA, which means Imprint, and we work on uh, gender-based violence and specifically sexual harassment 
uh, directed to women, men, and everyone. So, not mostly youth. Um, and my colleague. Uh, I'm Mirat Ramsis, representing Shuf uh, Taharaj, which means I saw harassment. Uh, work on sexual harassment in public spaces or private spaces and transportation. And all of us hope to end sexual harassment in Uganda. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't introduce myself before. My name is Chris Dolan. I run an organization called Refugee Law Project, which is an what we call an outreach project of the School of Law at Makerere University in Kampala in Uganda. Um, we work originally specifically only with refugees, uh, has grown over time to a whole range of different categories of forced migrants. And we combine direct services in terms of legal aid, psychosocial support, um, with more research and advocacy. Uh, it's something else we do as well, but <laughs> yeah, we got into a bit of trouble last year because we were also hosting something known as the Civil Society Coalition on Human Rights and Constitutional Law, which was a broad-based coalition established to challenge the anti-homosexuality bill in 2009, um, and for which we paid a bit of a a heavy price last year when we were suspended for pretty much the whole of last year, um, at the end of which we had to step down from hosting that coalition if we were to survive as an organization. I think those are my, my two big hats that I probably bring into this, this conversation. So we, just to sort of recap, we were looking at um, ways of organizing collectively which involved men, either that men assumed leadership around collectively organizing around gender-based violence um, and led initiatives on the basis of their identity as men, or uh, social justice movements where men became very heavily involved um, um, in the work also on gender-based violence. So we're looking at different ways of <coughs> collectively uh, mobilizing around gender-based violence involving men. Um, and I just want to, we'll have a number of, of questions and uh, you know, please feel free to, to, uh, to come into the conversation. But um, one of the first things that we were really engaging with over the last few days is entry points. Um, and entry points may seem like a, a developmental term, but it's actually really important. You know, what does it mean to engage on the ground? What, what do you do? What, how, how does it happen? And we're not, you know, one of the things obviously that came out very expectedly is that there isn't one particular way or one series. There isn't a, a recipe you put in place. There isn't a series of how to do steps. But we were engaging about what does it mean on the ground in different contexts. And I think I want to start with um, Chris about, you know, the context of Uganda where you, you started working with men on issues of gender-based violence, particularly sexual violence against men. And do you want to tell us how this started and what happened and how did you mobilize? What were the entry points? Yeah, thanks. Um, oh, you've put me on the spot. The, we, we had two different entry points. One was a project actually about, it was called Mobilizing Men, which was the project we did with IDS and where we, yeah, we, we, we asked people to come together and to sit down and think about gender-based violence and, and then engage in various activities and identify victims of such violence, bring them to the Refugee Law Project for support and so on. Uh, but the one I want to focus on now is more uh, where we, we started to see a number of, of our clients who were themselves victims specifically of sexual violence. And generally, a lot of it having happened in their country of origin, conflict, some of it having happened as refugees in Uganda. And, and that has led us on a completely different kind of journey in terms of how people have got mobilized. So the entry point, the strict entry point, was that the men who came forward were men who had severe medical 
complications arising from their experiences of sexual violence. Severe to the point where they just could not function. Many were suicidal. And where the, 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 the beginning of our work was really to, to try and help them to access the right kind of medical support. What happens after the medical support, if it's, if it's reasonably successful, and it's a slow process, it's not, you don't get quick fixes, but people say, no, okay, my body's better, what about my mind? And one of the steps that we took with that was to, to ask, suggest to people, you know, why don't you come together with a couple of other guys who've had a similar experience? To break down that sense of isolation, because something that not many people talk about if it's happened to them, and so often people are stuck not knowing whether they're the only one. And what we found, and we've, we've repeated this process in three different places, is that wherever we've managed to get a core group to come together, their numbers have escalated very, very rapidly. When we did that in, in Kampala, you know, we started off with I think, six individuals that we had done work with. They came together, sat together. We would accompany that process to an extent. That group now, I would say four years later, five years later, has maybe 150 members. In one of the refugee settlements <coughs> in Western Uganda, um, within a year, the group had 240 members. In Northern Uganda, working with former IDPs, we have a group with about 50 members. So the numbers are, are quite large. In, in all of those three categories, I would say those, even the 50 is quite a lot. What's been really interesting is the way that those groups have mobilized themselves to take actions to raise awareness and to challenge the institutions that are ignoring them. Because the reality is the, you know, the, the main institutions like UNHCR, the government itself, the health services available in refugee settlements in Kampala don't have anything available for for such cases. Um, and these guys have done a lot of self-organizing in different forms. Uh, you know, one of the really surprising ones for me in the refugee settlement was when members of the group got together. We, we do a, an annual sexual and gender-based violence awareness week. And we encourage people to come and present these and so on. And these guys got together not at our request, and put together a drama, you know, just demonstrating to people in the settlement itself. So they were basically outing themselves as survivors. And they did that right in the middle of the settlement with hundreds, if not thousands, of fellow refugees watching them out themselves as survivors of, of this form of violence. Uh, with the, the group in Kampala came to us one day and said, we want to, we need to talk to our local authority. Know, the, what they call LCs, the local councillors, because they just don't understand where we're coming from, and we need to sit down and talk with them. And they asked us to accompany them on that process. But we literally did that. We accompanied, we went along, and we were there. But they organised it, they set the agenda, they gave the main presentations, and you know, they established basically a new area of discussion and a bit of negotiation uh, <coughs> with the authorities. When we were suspended last year, one of the reasons given was that we were promoting homosexuality under the guise of human rights. And that line really came out in part from our work with male survivors, because so many people think that if you're a survivor as a man of sexual violence, it's probably because you'll get. So they were assuming that all these guys are homosexual. And we were working with all these presumed homosexuals. So that was one of the reasons we got suspended. Anyway, this group put together a video. Again, they didn't discuss it with us or anything. And, uh, you know, they, they, they put together a video challenging all of that. And the video is available. You can and come and yeah, talk to Chris about it yeah, if you want to see it. It's a really interesting one. So those are the entry point, medical. Yeah. And 
two and one in a practical sense is medical and at a more sort of theoretical sense it's men's own vulnerabilities rather than their privilege. Okay. Just to sort of compare this with a very different context where um, gender-based violence against women in the form of sexual harassment, which existed for many decades but had gotten much worse in the last uh, years in Egypt before the revolution, um, it, it was worked on but fundamentally by feminist groups, hardly any men involvement. After the revolution, this shifted tremendously with men reclaiming the issue as one of social justice, taking to the street, and um, all three initiatives that we have here from Egypt have worked tremendously um, on the street, um, and they didn't need to mobilize men. Men were mobilized, but they captured that and took it forward. The other issue is linking issues of gender-based violence towards a critical consciousness around patriarchy. And this is where Santa Shu been really, for over a decade, your organization has been working around making explicit the link between whatever you're doing on the ground with challenging notions of patriarchy. Um, are there any particular kinds of strategic ways of thinking uh, that are important to this? Yeah. Uh, when I'm looking the Maswa and, and, and we, uh, whole process was very much evolving. So initially stage we came with the very emotional that, okay, we are men and we have to take the responsibility and we don't want to see the any violence around us. Fine, then how we can move? And two things were very clear. One is man cannot be changed without reflection. One day workshop, one training cannot make the change. But this can start the process of change. So <coughs> men have to reflect and have to analyze the power relation. Power relation within the family, power relation within the society, within the community, and they have to also relate with the other intersections also. So, and when they reflect, they realize, and then they have to, at individual level, they have to act also. In the relationship, at the, at the home, with the, their relation with their children, with their partner, in their community, but the only reflection will not work. So, and once they are going to uh, make something effort, they need immediate support. So many times their, their change behavior is not accepted in the family. Family have never saw that if, if men uh, till tomorrow was uh, just uh, roaming around the, and now he is uh, washing the cloth or washing the dishes, it is not allowed. And, and some men are also going to uh, bully them. So where they can get the support and that need the peer support during that reflection in implementation of individual level. Same time, they have to come at the collective action. And collective action creates environment as well as create a, uh, a energy also within the group. And, and if one person is doing anything, uh, it may be uh, not uh, accepted in the society, but if the same thing is done with the, uh, followed by the 10 person, then it will become a social norm. So how we can individual action convert in the ch challenging the social norm and so we have to take some collective action and uh, we uh, every year 16 days continuous campaign was there the, sometime the incident based campaign is is there so if you, if any incident sometimes we found that we are doing the uh, we are doing the sickness campaign we are doing the uh, community <coughs> building and what is between that if and if there is a cases then we have to uh, you have to speak out we have to take the position polit politically so we have to tell the uh, people, media and, and other people that we are here not going to tolerate the violence and we have to, it means we have to reflect, we have to uh, work at the personal level as well as we have to uh, react and reflect and, and uh, act at the uh, public level in the community. So this was the major strategy we adopted in the work with men. One of the things you're raising is the issue of transformation that individuals pay a heavy Cost. And one of the things that uh, you were very strongly engaging with us, you know, as we all get excited about transformation and changes, be careful. We don't want individuals to pay very heavy prices for challenging norms and practices that are deeply embedded. And you talked a little bit, you gave an example of an individual level, how there is always this reflex reaction when things are not done the way they're supposed to. Um, the issue of a backlash is one of the issues that you, you know, it's, it's, we're talking about power relations here being challenged. Can you tell us a little bit yeah, more sure. about this? Uh, we can say we have uh, so many examples of violence. Uh, we can find 50% uh, was uh, 
uh, attended the workshop and then after three days, the second day, uh, 10 have gone. And after the completing in the workshop, 25%, uh, 30% never turn out. Some have to leave the community because there was a huge pressure and in our other project, our Excel Excel project, we found that sometimes within the family, uh, father of the boy was so much blaming and, and, and accusing and raised that the uh, and told that you, you don't know, you are unable to control your wife and your wife is sleeping with other men. And finally that man had to leave that family with his partner. So such times backless come and the peer have to come there. If I see the our uh, work in university, the vice chancellor was very much uh, appreciated and, and mobilized and motivated and told, yes, we have to take the action and we have to certainly make our campus violence free. But our three years later, when, when he saw that so many cases are coming and, and asking for justice and it become a prestige issue, then he immediately stopped. He told, though, no, this is Masa. Masa is a link with the NGO and NGO have to uh, take care of their own, own expenses earlier. All, all the infrastructure was free and, and, and there was a mass work within the campus. So this type of actors also came there. But if, if the members are within that community, within that campus, they have to find the solution and they found that, okay, we are not going to use the mass work. Uh, we are not going to use the name of Maswa in the banner, but we are going to work the same thing. We are going to organize the seminar in the name of social work department, or uh, uh, social student or social work department. Then, then administration cannot be. So, it means it is not costless. Certainly, there is a cost, and, and we have to create the support system also. If there is a backlash, where we are going to get the support from peer, from the uh, other uh, more like, a movement group, other the feminist group, other the media, and even the administration. So we have to build the linkage also. So we can manage these types up, but we have to, uh, if we understand from the last 10 years that if we are doing any, uh, designing the project, we have to build that there is a, uh, certainly there will be the backlash. And Philip, you also spoke about, during the last few days, we, we, different modalities of backlash, different ways of understanding a backlash also. Tell us a little bit about ways in which related to. Yeah, thank you so much, Marie. Uh, I, I think for for us in Kenya, one of the uh, backlash that we've had is uh, men talking about women having been given uh, too much space and too much. Uh, uh, I mean, space to, to really discuss their issues at the expense of the of the men and the boy uh, the boy child, for instance. And they are saying it's time that now we need to uh, shift our focus and really engage with with men and boys in a more purposeful way. And we've seen the emergence of uh, men's organizations that are really opposing the issues to do with gender equality, mm -hmm. because they look at it uh, as gender equality being for women, <coughs> as opposed to looking at it in the wider space where it's about uh, social justice and gender justice, so to speak. So uh, essentially, if we really focus our attention so much, and we must be very careful in terms of dealing with issues of backlash, and that we do not want to create a situation where gender is seen as uh, a women's issue, because I think for us that has been the key thing, and uh, uh, it, it, uh, it has really made our, our work somehow difficult because we have to constantly explain, explain ourselves that it's not about the women, it's about bringing about gender justice, which is, for both, uh, which is good for both men and boys uh, and, and the, the wider society. So those, those are things that are happening, and uh, they also, uh, we also need to have the understanding that not all men are violent. Yeah. Majority of men are very good, and uh, uh, even those who are not violent, the problem is they are silent bystanders when it comes to violence that is meted to men uh, and to women uh, by other men and even uh, women in the society. And therefore, we need to make them understand that engagement in the kind of work that you're doing has, has nothing really to do with their being a man, so to speak, but to create a society where social justice is the norm. Yeah, and and uh, I would, uh, I wanted also to maybe uh, make a little bit contribution to what Chris started by the entry point. I think it's also good for us to uh, when you want to in, uh, engage or work with men and boys to really meet them in their free space where they feel non-threatened. Uh, whether it is the church, it is the mosque, uh, or uh, their workspace, wherever they go to work, because that has also been very important for for us. 
we had the first engagement was really <coughs> finding men um, who are in the church groupings, yeah. the community-based organizations. And I think uh, in that space where they, they've created for their own can be a, a very good entry point for uh, working with them on issues of gender justice in, in, in the wider scale. Yeah. We're talking here about very long-term processes of transformation, things that you hope will be intergenerational. Um, rather than a sort of a three-year project where you dash in and dash out and you know that's it these are the most important lessons we've learned and you know maybe not somebody else will take on these lessons the back and move on so we're talking about just long processes of engagement and and sometimes these processes um you know you, you kind of plan for what you're going to do in the next few years and then in the case of egypt you had a change of pre you know after having one president for 30 years you had a change of three leaders in three years um, after having 50 years of one kind of rule, you suddenly have three regime changes in three years. Um, and, and it's really, you know, thinking about the, the, the context where imprint works, where initially imprint was responding to a security vacuum in protest spaces, as well as security vacuum affecting the subway and other spaces. Suddenly, that changes, change of political context, change of how people mobilize, and you want to sustain something that, that is very powerful and very important. Tell us a bit about what does it mean to sustain collective action inwardly? How do you keep the flame alive when things are quite turbulent? In imprint, it's, it's quite different from many other initiatives. In Basma, it's quite different from many other initiatives where um, where people already know what is sexual based violence is and already people who believe in gender equality and all that um, work on. But rather, we take people who just have, just want to stop it, just think that sexual based violence is wrong <coughs> and it needs to stop. How and where and, and all these questions are the questions that we ask them to come in to trust us enough to answer it with them. Um, and so this is where we expand our base of volunteers and our, our base of people who want to work against this kind of violence. Um, so for example, there are several, there are several men who entered uh, Bosma based on uh, protection, for example. They want to protect women and, and all that. And one of them said that, um, I entered Basma based on this, but now I believe in gender equality. I believe that men and women are equal and they have the right to public spaces equally with no discrimination whatsoever. And others had a backlash of losing friends, uh, losing their families, and not being able to communicate with the rest of the community as such because they are now having certain beliefs and they are fundamentally different because they believe that sexual based violence are, is um, not accepted, especially to women. Um, and then we have the case of uh, girls, for example. So we have girls who didn't know the rights, didn't want to know, and didn't care to know. They just wanted to you know, just live by and get married and have kids just so it's a society. Not that it's wrong, but it should be their choice. And at this point, after being with us for a year, they know how to stand up for their rights. They are very firm in what is theirs, their public space. They, they want to occupy it as much as possible because they believe in equality. And these are also just like, simple success stories with four people who stayed with us. We started out as 50, but then there are people who fell out, and it's fine. We thought that was fine. Because it's, at the end, it's about quality of people who stayed and wants to work with you, and not the quantity of many people who just like want to be there just for the fame, or just to feel like be a hero, or just whatever other reasons. And to test this theory was unintentional whatsoever. But what happened is, one of the people inside our group outed themselves as gay. And then, one of the guys, one of the other men, who's homophobic said, I will not work with him, I don't want him in my group, and we should all let him out. 
as a co-founders, me and other my co-founders said, this is not what we built it for, and it's not acceptable. Everybody should be here, please, and no discrimination whatsoever. And we just stepped back. We said, you know what, if you as a group, because we believe in everyone should share their opinion. And we just simply stepped back and said, it's yours at this point. After two weeks of me pulling my hair and thinking, oh my god, I'm going to lose this, and this idealistic notion of a safe space for everyone, they voted this guy out and said, you know what, you're destroying our safe space, you're disrupting the peace that we had there in our community, and therefore we cannot function outside in the community either, and we'd like you to leave. And this for me was like, yes, you know? And so one of the bas basic motivation is to create a safe space for them. In a country like Egypt, where nobody is able to express themselves freely, we give that space. So for us, it was giving space, education, knowledge, and treating them simply as human beings, all equal. One of the issues that you're raising is so important is you don't come into this with, this is our manifesto of our beliefs, we will go ahead and champion this or that and you know, we will follow this. Inner, internal processes of transformation happen on an individual as well as collective level because they cannot be separated. And I think um, Tuli and Chris wanted to add to this on internal um, you know, in, in, internal processes that are so crucial for how we understand the interface between internal and external processes of change. And perhaps we'll start with Tuli and then come back to you know, Chris on this question of uh, sustaining the, you know, keeping the flame alive, sustaining the collective action. And what does it mean on the ground? I think first I'd like to say how interesting it is that um, Phil spoke about uh, in, in Kenya, meeting people in spaces that already exist for them. Whereas back in South Africa, the challenge is that um, churches and you know spaces for walls are a rare thing for people to have in the first place. So one of the motivators of the collect uh, collective action is that when, when, when organizations like Sonke come in, they do offer a space like that for people to convene. It's, 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 it's that physical space where someone can point to and say that that's where I feel safe. That's where I feel there's an opportunity for self-development. That's where I feel I can know more about my rights as a human being, not man, not woman, but you know that, 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 that place where like-minded people can meet and walk the journey together towards um, social justice. Um, and also coming from South Africa, you have uh, uh, the, the, the impact of HIV and, and AIDS and TB, where you find many child-headed households um, which have an impact on, on, on uh, families. And you have uh, families that are headed by grandmothers who are probably not educated either, and they have to raise this generation of kids who don't have the role models maybe that they, that in a nuclear family would exist. So these are just some of the challenges that uh, uh, Sonke um, does face. But there's, there's also like, uh, she, um, Nihal and Phil, uh, they raised some really good points and, uh, Satish, that at the end of the day, if like-minded people meet towards um, a certain goal, the collective action is possible. It seems far now, but it is possible. And these spaces, whether it's a four, it's a four-roomed uh, house, whether it's a space just, you know, in your head where you feel safe, if those can be afforded to people, I think we we will have gone half. A mile. Yeah, my, my comment is it's, it's related definitely about how do you create the spaces. Um, There's also a comment about the way in which most people in this room, I'm guessing, will have worked in terms of being part of the development industry and projectization. Um, you know, the, the creation of safer spaces which in turn allow people to become something other than they were in terms of their attitudes and their beliefs. That's the part which doesn't get funded. You know, 
know, if I look at my own organization, we've spent many years now creating a safer space uh, for anti-discriminatory positions and enabling different people with very different people, different experiences to to work through their experiences and their processes and you know and that you can't do that if you're not working with people who hold those values and those values you don't just as you say you don't come with a what do you call it a, a manifesto we do have a little manifesto we have a contract in ours we have an employment contract with an anti-discrimination clause which sets out all the things that we will not accept discriminatory behavior so that at least we have something that someone signed that when they do discriminate, we can point back to it. But, you know, that's, that's very mechanical in a sense. Um, but the, the process of people sort of changing their self-perception and their, their self, even their sense of their own identity. And I think it's interesting that the whole discussion about, you know, masculinity is, and okay, we've got a really rubbish masculinity here, let's, let's somehow take that one out and put a better one in its place if that were possible. I think it is possible, but I think it's a whole process in its own right. It requires time and it requires that safer space. Um, it's interesting, I have one colleague who I remember one day sort of introducing himself, and he, all his work is on administration. And he introduced himself, he said, you know, my name is ABC and I'm a social justice activist. And, it, you know, it was really great when he said it, because it just, it, was like, it is actually true in the sense that you know, within his position, he was doing A, B, C, D to completely change the way in which administration happened, in which issues were dealt with and resolved. But that stuff is not funded. You know, so even the, all the projects that we do with, together with IDS, we're always within some kind of very bounded time space, which may not coincide with these dynamics and these <coughs> personal transformations which are actually what enable <coughs> collective mobilization to happen. Just on this theme of collective mobilization, um, you, you, you worked on creating a safe space, but you also worked on, uh, you were very cognizant of the power <coughs> politics that in order for you to be able to um, um, be able to challenge uh, structures of you know, structures of constraint and, and and various levels of 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 inequalities that you needed to also not just connect within but connect outside and so you were also very keen on on the the collective action beyond the groups that you worked with. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and, and its importance to the work that you were doing? Well, I think through the work that we did. It was really important, well, well, I think on any project, it's really important to recognize your own strengths and your own weaknesses, because then you, by doing that, you're honest about what you're able to do, and also identifying other people that you could um, work with towards a cause, and in, in order to reach your goals, maybe you, like we worked with Songe and the IDS, we brought something very different to the party, and Sonke also brought their rich and uh, the, their rich knowledge and experience, and their connections with the different communities that they've been working in. And um, then there was the IDS, and all these connections um, helped us to to reach the goal that we had set out. But more because we were sharing knowledge, we were sharing experience, skills, and. Ultimately, there was also new knowledge that was created, and I don't know if we would have been able to do that as a one-man show. So it, it, I feel that it's also quite important that when we look at collective, we don't just look at it on the ground. We, we must also look for other partners, other people who can walk with us um, through this, this journey. I think Amel spoke about that a lot. Um, in the week about the fact that you 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 may work you may also work with people that you don't like, but because they're doing uh, you know you you have similar objectives. 
towards this goal. I, I, I hate your guts, but you know, for the people that we work with, let's just put that aside and you know, just do what needs to be done. I think just on a, you know, Amal is also considered in a deeply polarized context, such as Egypt, where just about everybody hates everybody else who's not from the same political <laughs> camp. Um, you know, and and it's, 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 it reaches the point where in, in families, you, you, know, you have a father <coughs> who is pro-X and a mother who is pro-Y and children who are more or less split. And you know, it reaches the point where people couldn't have, sit and have breakfast together because it was so deeply. And in between all of this, which also amplified along the different groups, you were also very keen to try and, and uh, you know, uh, build a sense of collectivity uh, because you made reference to that. Maybe just a very short in interjection before we go back to Phil on, on linking it to the backlash. Okay. Yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I was earlier in the discussion of giving so many examples of really how we all around, like uh, with the two, uh, with, with Shift al Harush and with Basma, but with other groups as well in Egypt, work together towards ending of sexual harassment. And sometimes on the table you can find a very kind of radical, like a very radical socialist and then extremely leftist and, and, and some of a more of a religious background and they're sitting together. And ideologically they're different and they do disagree and sometimes really conflicts happen. But in the end of the day, you also see a lot of initiative that happens that you say, okay, X, Y, Z, we um, agree on this issue, let's work on it together. And A, B, C, L agree on other issues, and they're okay with working with the government, so let's work on building the strategy of gender-based violence. But these groups don't work with the government, but then they can work with the with the with this with this international research institute. So by doing that and really moving be beyond really uh, this, these hurdles, then we're able to do more of a collective action rather than really being stopped by these differences, these ideological, sometimes political differences, and really kind of make them like the monster and, and not moving beyond them, because then in the end, the work will not going to be done. That's the, and the most important thing, the women, because at the end of the day, we are actually there to give a voice for the voiceless and help the woman. It's not about really disagreeing about our ideological problems and, and political positions. So so we really, I think, over, we learned this lesson also. We also grow in the process, and that's also talking, linking back to the earlier point of really the dynamics and how they change. We, we are, before the revolution 2011, we are so different than after the revolution. We also learned along the way with so many things that things do change, and, and then we have been pluralized a lot, and, and, and we learned that we should not keep, let these uh, really affect our, uh, our focus and our reaching the certain objective that we set to ourselves. Mm. So there are zillions and zillions of examples later, maybe I can share with some of you. You raised a really important point about when we think about collective action, even if there's consensus around an issue that it is we all share, we all believe in, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It doesn't have to be that we all agree to work together or we don't work together at all. Mm. Sometimes division of labor, division of roles, um, you know, we work on, you will work on this front, I'll work on this front, um, really helps it. It's still collective, but it doesn't have to be under one common umbrella. And it's really, really important because uh, we tend to think of collective action in unitary terms. Mm. But you also struggled quite a bit with collective action too, because you talked about the backlash against women's equality, and yet the fundamental ideology from which you engaged failed was a genuine belief in gender equality. I mean, this is something that you believe in down to the, the DNA <laughs> level. So how, you know, you, you still, even though that you were aware of all of these dynamics, you were still keen to establish links and bridges. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I think one of the key things we really need to uh, understand is that sometimes there's a lot of uh, um, information and knowledge that you can generate from even the people who oppose your cause. Because most of the time when we hear somebody saying, ah, I don't like those people, and then you just forget about that and say, oh, those ones are noise makers. Yeah. But it's important also to listen to them and really get to understand what are they trying to say, because that can also form the basis for your next level of programming and engagement. 
Uh, and uh, uh, I, I remember in October when we had, uh, uh, in Nairobi especially, we had this crisis when women were being stripped because of wearing short dresses and short skirts and all that. And it became such a huge thing. It actually became a national kind of phenomenon. And uh, when we were demonstrating one of the days, men, we were in, on the streets demonstrating and saying, and with all these t-shirts that threatened my dress, my choice, mm -hmm. we, we were actually, some, some men were there saying, oh, and you, you are participating in this. You are crazy. You are, you are such a, a kind of a weak man or something. Mm -hmm. uh, you are out of your mind. And uh, they, they actually found themselves to even counter that kind of a demonstration, just to show us how much they were also powerful. But at that point in time, uh, the good thing that was also happening is that there were men who were joining into the demonstration, just looking at, oh, what, what is it all about? Then you tell them it's about the streaming that has been going on, and they say, oh my, yeah, this could happen to my sister, this could happen to somebody so close to me. So what that tells us is that really, you need uh, to pay attention to the people who are against you, mm -hmm. but at the same time, uh, not losing focus in what you want to achieve by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, the main thing is really to uh, uh, create networks and the linkages in terms of coalition building and how you link that uh, in terms of uh, working with men and boys and how you link that with the, the women's movements and uh, the, the, the other forms of social justice movements that are around. Because it's important uh, to work together uh, uh, on a common cause as opposed to working in isolation. Mm -hmm. And I think by and large what, what has been happening is that every other time that we want to engage with people then we really need to build their capacity to be able to undertake a particular course of work and, and engagement. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't really understand uh, uh, and, and uh, they are moving forward without the knowledge of what it's really uh, about, mm -hmm. then they are the same ones who will come in and then get out and say, these people are so useless and what we are doing is actually not proactive in terms of uh, engaging with the society. Mm -hmm. So uh, in terms of linking that with the, with the kind of work that we do with the working with men and boys and in terms of collective action, I think it's very important for us also to uh, find uh, ways of uh, working through multi-sectoral approach across sectors, mm -hmm. just to ensure that that which, like Tuli alluded much earlier, that mm -hmm. that which I'm, uh, I'm not capable of doing, or we are not capable of doing as a, as, as a movement, can, or as an organization, can be done by a different organization. Mm -hmm. And that way you create referral pathways mm -hmm. in terms of the things that you are not able to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's, re it's, re it's really helps in even sustainability issues, mm -hmm. because sometimes uh, even when it comes to sustainability, you look at what is happening across the globe and bringing it down and just to make sure the, moment, the momentum is not, is not, is not lost rather. Mm -hmm. And people keep on and continuously build on what they've started as we, as we move along. Yeah. One of the points you raised is knowledge, mm -hmm. which is a very tricky one because obviously information <coughs> is not the same as knowledge. And we at IDS, we, we um, engaged with the idea of learning, so we went there to learn. Um, but I think it would be a waste, you know, these are uh, groups and initiatives and movements who, um, who stand as not, I mean, it's great that you, you know, you, you engage with the outside community, but it's not like they have a lot of time um, just to sort of hang around uh, the IDS people to, to share, you know, as much as, I'm sure we're wonderful people to hang around, but you know, you've got better things to do with your time. Um, so one of the things that, um, uh, this was supposed to be a joke. My, my daughter always says, don't joke, mommy, because you're very bad at joking. <laughs> so, um, but the, you know, one of the, when we were having this uh, conversation, uh, Rokia, you raised the importance of doing research in a way that is relevant, that is not just about good practice or learning or what kind of knowledge is useful but something else fundamental to embedding it into the actual process of you know making it meaningful as well can you tell us a little bit more about uh, that because yeah, sure, thank you um, and so it um i mean one of the things that you want when you're a researcher and i'm not a researcher um, but my understanding from friends and colleagues is that one of the things that you want is your research to be responsive. You don't want your, your, the heart that you put into the papers and the policies that you write and your, to, to sit on the shelf somewhere. It needs to be useful. And that was one of our, um, um, when we started 
speaking with IDS about why we would be involved in this, in, in this research, it was unequivocal for us that it comes at a time where in South Africa we are um, at the tipping point of, of an epidemic of violence. That the violence have beca has become so um, seeped into every fiber of what we do and who we are that it hampers us economically, socially, um, even spiritually in our context. And so um, what the benefit of us partnering with, with IDS has been that this case study has been the catalyst for a mobilizing advocacy strategy on realizing a national strategic plan on ending violence in South Africa. So we were able to dig into not just what the collective action <coughs> look like in ending violence, but also the individual through the stories that you will see um, later on, the digital stories. And we were able to, so, so I, I think it's important for me to say this, that in South Africa, our campaign for a gender-based violence national strategic plan is not the end, but it's the means to an end for us. And the content from this case study has formed the basis of that. We were able to build a platform of partner organizations to engage around not just service delivery and why do, does the ju judiciary and the law enforcement not work, <coughs> but what does it mean if we go upstream and we look at where the violence comes from and how do we unlearn the violence and how do we not create or, or raise another generation of men who are users of violence. And so my call really is for, for all of you in, in, in your spaces that you occupy whether that's through your families, through this institution, through the countries that you come from, to sign a petition for a gender-based violence national strategic plan and to realize that whatever little way you're involved in this uh, research case study or whichever other case study, is that it does resonate. It does send a thunderclap around the world toward ending violence. And I think that's important, that, that your research is not static. And I, I certainly haven't experienced ideas as static. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that very practically that Rukia was telling us about, which I, I you know, so just, you know, in a context where you have blackouts, electricity blackouts, where you know, <laughs> uh, uh, certain yeah. forms of communication, like laptops and and uh, uh, tablets, sometimes are quite expensive if you want to have a massive outreach. One of the things that you were thinking about is some of the digital stories. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I don't know how much people know about the different, the, the different methods we used, um, participatory methods or, um, we used in the study, but one of it was um, digital storytelling. And so we, we brought uh, community activists together um, to learn how to, to first be courageous enough to share their own stories of, of, of either experiencing violence or possibly using violence. And, and that story was told in, in, in beautiful ways, in very personal ways. And some of the activists, and it was, it was their choice whether they wanted to use that story for advocacy and campaigning and mobilizing or not. And some of them have chosen to use that story to shift where we are in South Africa in, in addressing violence. But the challenge with that is that we don't have laptops and, um, compu or computers or, or even spaces where we are able to, to project those stories. And so some of the things we've been thinking through with Thea and Beth and the IDS colleagues was, well, how, what are the other mediums for us to be able to, to share this, for them to be able to share their stories? And, and some of that is through... Um, Mobile, uh, mobile phones, um, because everyone has an Android phone now. You know, you can download apps, and so, so how, so using that as a medium, and so it's that whole thing about how do you use technology tactically in in your advocacy and mobilizing, but then also how do you go back to the good old days where when you go to a conference and you're doing a um, a poster, um, you know, what did it look like if we were able to do a, a digital story as a poster? or as a flip chart in doing information education in clinics. So that's kind of where we're at now. And so how do we as an organization hold ourselves accountable to making sure that the digital stories that activists have, have invested themselves in does not become 
something that collects dust. And so I don't know if that's what you meant, but I mean it's. Um, but if you have laptops, be at home. I'll gladly take them home. <laughs> no, it's too far. Too much. Building on that theme, <coughs> technology and knowledge, um, in a context uh, such as that of Egypt where uh, knowledge was always top down, so research produced bottom up from initiatives is, was never considered authoritative by the authorities. Then you had a situation which actually people were looking to the research that you were producing and which you were trying to collect in unconventional ways in order to circumvent a huge number of very practical hurdles. So maybe if we can link that to the idea of relevant, what you said, responsive research. When the Harass map in 2010 was established, it started with the map. We wanted to know, um, to map sexual harassment. We wanted to know where is sexual harassment taking place, what's the context of sexual harassment, types of sexual harassment, experience of women who experience sexual harassment. Even we wanted to know if it's only women experience sexual harassment or men. Um, also experience sexual harassment. So we set this platform using the Yushahidi open source for for anybody actually anonymously to, to log into it and, and write their experience. So um, one of the things we found very useful, we received so many reports over the year. Actually when we launched in 2010, two days after the launch, the system crashed because a lot of women were trying to access the system to report the incidents of sexual harassment that happened to them. And for them, the platform was the first uh, place where they actually can write their experiences. It was a haven for them, so to So, so um, along that, we collected the, these reports that was, of course, anonymous report. And we start reading through them, and, and then we start collecting the story. Um, uh, and then we were confronted with a very important question that people always ask, especially when we start to do a policy document and uh, try to present these numbers to the authority. To what extent do you know these are not fabricated kind of reports? How authentic are these reports? How correct this evidence that you generate? And I think for all of you who works in the field know that crowdsourced methods are also very contested kind of methods of data collection in vis-a-vis -vis empirical and has very low credibility, especially in social sciences, have taken, taken off in other domains, especially in crisis settings, um, natural, uh, natural crisis or humanitarian settings, but especially in social sciences have been widely contested because of the biases. There are, of course, a lot of biases to it in terms of sampling, in terms of who, who write the story from which perspective, and so on and so forth. Uh, so what we have done is we couldn't do, of course, a comparative study, but we did what we call uh, we triangulate the data. We kind of did a hypothesis of who are the people who most likely report on on the map, so we, we assume they are probably educated because they can use the computer, they come from not a very low, super low class because then they, this means they probably have an access to internet and to computer. We put a certain criteria of, an, of a, a kind of an imagined subject, sort of. And we went to the field uh, uh, with, with, um, and, and, and did a data collection asking similar question to the one we asked in, in, the, in the map um, with this, based on this inclusion criteria that we hypothesized. And we compared the two data or the two sets of data. Of course, there was, we had, couldn't really compare it because we had a lot of missing questions in the data on the reports coming from. But we tried to look at what we have. And what we really came up with in terms of the analysis is that definitely there are trends, meaning that there, the, the map gives a very, very correct, to a big extent, correct trends. So for instance, we found that the age that, that the people report in terms of who, are, who is the perpetrator is very similar to the age reported into the field. The timing where sexual harassment takes place 
very close to the one reported uh, in the map, and so on and so forth. So we came up with a, a conclusion that, yes, it might not be representative, and yes, there might, there might be a lot of biases, uh, but also, yes, it gives accurate trend. Uh, trends you can be able and and by really running or uh, concluding that that then we can establish cross sourcing other methods for data collector which is actually can help us because sexual harassment is a social phenomenon which means it's it's very dynamic it changes all the time so we cannot have the money to do empirical research every year but then you can collect data from the crowdsourcing every year and every six months. That can give you a trend of really how this dynamic of this phenomena might be changing um, and can be very helpful in really building the interventions and that what you're using. We're using the, the reports that comes and then build the interventions and build our intervention and feed into the rest of the And one of the obviously common factors is, is the fact that we are here fundamentally, again, not talking about innocent documentation, we're talking about power relations. <coughs> this, this was one of the issues that we, you're also constantly reminding us about throughout, the, throughout these last few days, um, is uh, not, you know, the link between knowledge and wider power relations in the community, um, in policy, in praxis, and whatever. Can, we have I think, some of the reflections that you wanted to. Well, I, I think I mean there was a there was a remark I wanted to make about um, you know, the, the importance of connect, connecting these collective voices to the powers that be and the policymakers that, that are there, and but also the importance of how those collective voices are packaged. Um, whether they're packaged as their own voices or whether they get appropriated and offered up uh, by intermediaries. Um, you know, I think there's, there's a constant tension there because on the one hand, if you're interacting with UN agencies and so on, or government departments, they tend to be very wedded to institutions that they feel comfortable with. Um, but on the other hand, that, that immediately entails a co-optation process. And that's, I, I just think that's a tension which we need to be aware of. And we need to be very cognizant of it and careful about, you know, if a video gets made, whose video is it? If a report gets written, who are the authors of the report? And so on and so on. I think it's, it's, a, it's a constant tension and you have to sometimes play it one way and sometimes the other way. Because for sure, if you've got the voices you know, and some sense of authenticity of those voices, they can have a lot more impact actually on the policy decisions than a, a more formalized and systematic, uh, technically proficient survey, for example. And quite often it is the story we said that, I think, on day one. Yes. Sometimes it's the stories that trigger the change mm -hmm. rather than the much more rigorous data. Mm -hmm. So the stories are really important. Mm -hmm. And of course, when we talk about narratives, there are really stories with power relations in them. So it's, we yeah. kept on coming back to stories in different ways. Yeah, I just want to try uh, uh, one sentence to say, um, when, we, when we talk about research, I think it's very important for us to really know what we are researching and for who and how we want to use that research. Because many other times when we conduct lots and lots of researches and then we just put them on some shelf somewhere. Yeah. And they, they, they essentially do not form uh, policy and practice uh, yeah. in the field. So I think it's important for us to know why we are going to engage in some uh, form of research and uh, for who and uh, what do we intend to achieve by the end of the day. Because most of the time I've seen uh, we come up with very good uh, research documentation, but. Uh, it lies somewhere, nobody has ever seen it, nobody has ever utilized the findings and all that. So it, for me, it will be key uh, before you even uh, engage, uh, endeavor yeah. to, to, to try and conduct a research, really know what you want to achieve by it. Well, that's one comment. Sweet, it's just <laughs> frequently satisfied. Yeah. 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 Just one thing, uh, one, um, when we are conducting any research, uh, we, have to,
how research is going to support the active voices and how active voices is going to influence the research one thing other uh, if we are talking about the sustainability if you make the project i found it is very problematic so whether <coughs> the whole process is able to add the value of the member add the value of the leader those are stakeholder whether the media whether the other members is they are getting the value adding there and is the whole process is Uh, link with the some existing localized uh, resources available and the institution available so it may be help to make the voices uh, lively and and for more uh, uh, time it's really good to such a very very good yeah i mean, i just think we're using video a lot and the issue of digital storytelling um we also do a lot of video work we haven't used that particular technique but what It's common to what Julie's been telling us about, and there's an example coming up this evening. I think is that when people, if you, if you use some of that audio and visual technology, and people put their own voices there, when they hear themselves speak or they see themselves on video, it's an incredibly empowering process, and then they make their own decisions. about putting that voice out there mm -hmm. and those are the voices that end up changing the discourse so it's, it's really yeah